Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the latest Bright Talk NSFM Next Gen SDG webinar on sustainable growth, responsible investment, and green jobs, so SDG 8. Bright Talk's webinar series was actually developed in collaboration between Bright Talk and NSFM Next Gen and provides environmental, social, and governance, so ESG research insights and best practices from leading experts in industry and academia across markets, asset classes, and the entire investment value chain. The 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals are leading framework for sustainability issues, and they serve as our roadmap to identify, classify, measure, and benchmark key issues. The SDG number eight webinar kickstarts the series and provides insights on a variety of different topics. So this time we are talking about decent work and economic growth. And we have speakers from CBI, SAP, Revenitif, and NSFM Next Gen, as well as the University College Dublin, who will provide unique insights into how legislative efforts in the sustainable finance space are expected to make a profound impact on both the business and investment landscape. We will evaluate how this development from normative to mandatory action is actually making a landfall. And we are looking at a variety of different opportunities on how innovators can actually achieve key growth and innovation in the workspace and beyond. I'm hosting this webinar in the name of the NSFM Next Gen Initiative, which focuses on supporting young professionals and academics across the sustainable investment, banking, and insurance industries by providing an online platform for engagement, knowledge exchange, career opportunities, and mentorship. For more information and how to keep up to date and engage with the NSFM Next Gen Initiative, please visit nsfmnextgen.org. And I'm now handing over to our host, Theo Cordiano, who will actually be leading us for the next 60 minutes discussing sustainability in the context of green jobs, growth, and innovation. Thank you very much, Theo, and I'm delighted having you all on the call. Thank you so much, Martina, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on this great webinar. So I am Todo Cogliano. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the University College Dublin, and it's really my greatest pleasure and quite the treat to have such a distinguished panel addressing the topics of sustainable growth, responsible investment, um, responsible innovation, as well as really the future of um, green jobs. Um, Today we're going to discuss how the low carbon economy transition impacts not just the business and the investment world, but ultimately how it impacts our careers and livelihoods. And this thing seems to be uh, really well understood, particularly by the over 1.6 million teens around the world who strike on Fridays for the climate rather than studying for a world that does little to mitigate or adapt to climate change. So with that being said, um, I'm really glad to introduce our today's panel today. And so in alphabetical order, I would like to start with... um, Professor Andreas Hoppner, who is a professor of operational risk banking and finance at University College Dublin. Um, Andreas is also serves on the school's management team as the vice principal for equality, diversity, and inclusion. And since June 2018, he has served on the European Union's technical expert group on sustainable finance as an independent member. He's also currently serving on the Finance Green Ireland Committee. Uh, on the committees of the Investment and Pensions Europe Awards, the Investment Innovation Benchmark, as well as uh, on the boards of various organizations. Very much looking forward to Andreas' perspective. The second speaker I'm delighted to introduce is Sean Kidney, who is the CEO of the Climate Bonds Initiative, um, whose work was crucial in developing the green bond market, which last year alone, um, so over... 160 billion US dollars in new issuances around the world. Sean focuses on promoting investment priorities uh, for the climate and green bonds. He also sits on the high level expert group on sustainable finance of the European Commission as well as 
on the technical expert group as well as the India Green Bonds Council. Very much look forward to Sean's perspective on today's discussion. Next, and you've already heard from Martina, who is the uh, president of the Network for Sustainable Financial Markets. Um, it was the social network for the next generation for sustainable finance, banking, and insurance. And Martina is really a pioneer in the responsible investment uh, scene, having worked at S&P Global, Hermes US, SCISG Research, as well as in you know, product development, Lloyd Banking Group, Insight Investment, um, and several other banking institutions. Um, Martina, thank you for also co-hosting this, and I look forward to the discussion. Um, I'm also delighted to welcome Natasha Pergel, who is an innovation manager at SAP, who is a market leader in um, enterprise software. Um, Natasha works um, with many companies, helping them on their um, business intelligence journey, working with technologies such as the Internet of Things, machine learning, AI, and blockchain. Um, she has co-led SAP's The Plastic Challenge with focus on reducing and eliminating plastic waste from the global supply chain. So I look, we look forward to hearing from Natasha more on that. And she's also uh, 2019 uh, Women in Advertising and Communications London Futures Leaders and the Alumni for Marketing Academy Fellow. Last but not least, um, I'm so delighted to have uh, Elena Filipova, who together with uh, Sean and Andreas serves on the EU Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance and also Global Head of ESG at Refinitiv. Um, she is also one of the pioneers in, in responsible investment um, and is based in, in Bar in Switzerland at Refinitiv and started her career as a research analyst at Morgan Stanley um, in Florida before she joined um, asset for uh, an ESG data provider in 2005. So there's so much, so much experience um, on this panel and I would be delighted to get your questions as we go and if I deem appropriate, I will insert some of your questions already throughout the discussion. If not, we will try our best to address them um, in the Q&A session. So without further ado, I will start quizzing our distinguished panel and start with uh, Sean Kidney. So, Sean, can you please tell us what is the EU Technical Expert Group uh, trying to achieve? Uh, how does it propose to achieve it? Uh, of course, also try to address why. Why is this the case? Why is the EU doing this now? And I would be delighted if you can also give us a glimpse on what the green taxonomy is. And with that, I hand it on to Sean. Well, clearly Europe faces unbelievably severe environmental challenges, as does the planet. Europe is a key part of the planet. And that is climate change. Not only climate change, we have other issues too. Degradation of species, v rapid biodiversity loss, um, and so on and so on. But climate change is the overarching one. We're currently heading into a century of extremely volatile weather, the new norm for our societies. At the very minimum, we rapidly have to adapt to serious heat stress, to storms three times as violent and so on, and the consequent impact on vulnerable human populations around the world. But it's much more than that, because with the kinds of changes that are being forecast, whole areas of the planet will have to be voided of population to survive, which will mean massive movements of people realistically, these kinds of changes are catastrophic. That's the word being used by most leaders in this area. So Europe is absolutely committed now to try to address those. Last year, after a long fight on the part of progressive forces in Europe, the European Commission adopted a target of net zero carbon emissions for Europe by 2050. This is a fantastic target. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'd like it to be net zero carbon by 2030. But compared to anyone else in the world, this is superb and it's the appropriate trajectory to go for. The Sustainable Finance Action Plan of the European Commission is intended to help drive capital towards the solutions to meet that target for Europe. The taxonomy is a base tool, a base utility to help us do that. What the taxonomy is meant to do is to define investments 
that are required or material to achieving the Paris Agreement and the 2050 zero net carbon target. It's meant to be ambitious because if you know anything about this, if you've read the IPCC report from the middle of last year or even the International Energy Agency's World Energy Outlook in November, we have got to do a hell of a job in the next few years to get emissions going down globally in Europe and around the world. Now, of course, Europe is not just uh, an economy working of its own borders. We're the holder of significant reserves of global capital. We have also the holder of international centres of capital. Investors in Europe help drive economies around the world. When we're developing a taxonomy, we're looking at ideas for or, or specifics about the kinds of investments due to the Paris Agreement outside of Europe, around the world, as well as in Europe, because that's how capital will flow. When I know a company in Indonesia wants to raise money in Europe, it'll have to meet the taxonomy enough if it's going to be called sustainable or green and vice versa. This will link up with the climate risk disclosure regulations that Europe's bringing in, which will disclose green as well as brown or red, as some people call it, investments and risk and so on. This will link up with various other initiatives that the Commission and member states are pursuing to ensure that their uh, allocation of capital within the European Union is more consistent with what we have to do to change our societies to avoid an utterly catastrophic future. That's what we're trying to do. Now, if you want insights into what that means, that means that we need to be clear that all clean energy needs to be included. But it's much more complicated than that. 25% of emissions in the energy sector come from transport. What's the kind of transport that we need to have in the future? Well, yes, it is bicycles and pedestrian, but it's also mass transit. Electric mass transit is a critical part of the transition. Yes, electric vehicles play a role. Do diesel golf, golfs play a role? No. And there'll be a threshold designed to drive the transport sector towards zero net carbon emissions. The same in the building sector, the same in the manufacturing sector. What does this mean for steel? Well, it means we need to change the processes to ensure that uh, we go for low emission options, that we capture carbon where we can, and that we shift the energy sources that are driving steel and aluminium to clean energy. So that's what the taxonomy does. It maps this out so that we end up having a procurement list. Anyone, any ordinary citizen or small business should be able to go online and see whether, what activities are in and what activities are out. So if you're a manufacturer of triple glazed windows in Dortmund, you can go online and you will see that your activity is counted as part of the sustainable finance taxonomy, which means you could issue a green bond, you could apply for a green loan, or you could avail yourselves of other incentives that might be there. If you're not on the list, you need to think about whether you're part of the future or not. Does that make sense? Thank you so much for, for that perspective. So our challenge is very much urgent, and as I understand, we need to move in that respect really fast. That means that, of course, both the investment and the business world would need to, as well as governments and pressure from civil society, will need to make this transition happen very fast. So now I will turn to um, Elena. Um, and so in, in light of what Sean just said, um, what do you think about the potential of the work of the Commission to encourage further innovation in environmentally sustainable financial instruments? Um, and, and I would love to also know your perspective on, on whether uh, and which asset, class, um, which asset classes are likely that investors will impact most the transition with. Um, and of course, also a view as you also Refinitiv is, is also working in uh, is also a corporation. I would love to also know your perspective um, as a company on how companies can respond to this in in, in light of EU legislation. Thank you very much, and hello everyone. Um, I think it's important to re-emphasize uh, a key point that Sean made. Um, the action plan is intended to drive capital towards the commitments of the EU, which are so essential for our own society continuity and the prosperity of our economy. So the main objective of the action plan 
um, and the work of tech is to address key blockers and adoption hurdles that the industry faces to shift urgently to sustainable um, capital markets and economy. There are common standards and definitions, um, eco-labels, harmonization guidelines and disclosure. The action plan is very rich and very comprehensive. And these are the uh, key blockers that prevent us from um, uh, broader adoption uh, and for shifting the way that the society works, uh, which is the only way to ensure prosperity and continuity. It is not to constrain the market, and it is not to limit innovation. It's very important to be very clear um, in that um, um, point. Now that um, we have that clarified, um, the only way forward for a sustainable future is through innovation. And the criticality of fundamentally different business models, products, services, and skill sets needs to be well understood. Um, the businesses that adopt the quickest and innovate the hardest will be the ones that will succeed in the future. And with any such fundamental shift um, and change, there will be those that will uh, lose and those that will die. So it's very important to make sure that business leaders stay ahead of the curve and are able to, to predict um, what are the, the urgent changes and implications of this action plan on their business models? Now, in terms of different asset classes, um, ESG is relatively uh, better understood when we talk about equities. And there is a variety of financial products currently available in the market for this asset class from which investors can choose from. However, the challenge really in... Um, in broad adoption is, is the lack of comparability, lack of transparency and ease of use to select the right solutions for the individual investor objectives. Um, but we at Refinitiv truly advocate that it's very important to not view ESG or sustainability as something uh, done on the side, to truly leverage the power uh, and the business case of sustainability um, the only way that this can be done is through full integration into traditional investment strategies, into conventional benchmarks and products, not as a standalone product offering which sits on the side of everything else for investors to choose from. It has to be part of every single investment decision making. It has to be part of any product regardless of the asset class it belongs to. Um, I mean, we as a, as a business um, at Refinitiv um, fully understand the, the importance of, of shifting the way that everyday decision making uh, is made. Um, and this is um, starting from, um, from the top of the organization and cascading down to, to all layers of the organization and um, making it um, a BAU business as usual mode in every single decision that is made um, by any employee. And it's very important to understand the implications for the future workforce. Um, it is part of any recruitment decision making that we make um, and, and when we operate and drive the direction in which the company will go, the, pro the products that are being developed, sustainability is, is a key consideration. Um, so it, it, in terms of what that means for all the other businesses and all the industries, um, it is they better act quickly and urgently. All stakeholders are demanding it, the industry is changing, um, and that's the only way to retain uh, um, growth and prosperity in the future. Thank you so much for uh, for for that, uh, Elaine, and thank you for clarifying that um, the EU is not trying to constrain the market, but actually trying to spur innovation and provide guidance. Um, and also, as you've also said, um, investors are more familiar with um, integrating environmental social governance factors in their equity and now studying the bond product. 
Uh, and if we look actually at, for example, the fossil fuel divestment movement, because it started in the universities and many of the university pension plans were invested in these products, um, of course, equities have gotten a lot of attention. And so my question, and now I move to Andreas, who is next to me, is, Andreas, how, do we, how can we impact climate justice? Are um, equities the way forward? How can we think about the broader instruments that we have um, available? And also, how is the state of disclosure of green activities going to be enforced? Uh, also thinking about the challenges that we have in terms of disclosing uh, greenhouse gas emissions accurately, What's your view on that? Yeah, so I think in the first place, it's important to basically uh, come back to the question of who actually owns the market. And the market is owned by the end investors, and the end investors are insurances, pension funds, sometimes financial institutions, some high net worth individuals. But in the end, it's society that owns the market. And so society is not in any way being constrained by sustainable finance. Society is being informed by sustainable finance about the activities of some of the companies, and then society can make an informed choice if they wish to refinance these companies, if they wish to engage uh, via their shareholdings with these companies, and to what degree the behavior of the companies is in line with the wishes of society based on sustainable development goals, based on societal culture, based on... Um, any other which a society may have. So in many ways, you can think of the market as a little bit of a valuated version of society. And so in that sense, what are the options that society has? So the options society has is engaging with their um, companies they invest in on the equity side. So it's kind of engaging with equity, and that can be very successful and reduce downside risk, as we show in our research with Hermitius. Uh, data that their activities are significantly reducing downside risk, and then society also has the advantage or possibility of engaging with companies when companies wish to refinance. So as a bondholder, you have very little uh, opportunities other than to go through the courts and basically sue companies for breaking your covenants. But before you are a bondholder, as a bond investor, you have the opportunity not to actually refinance this company and society's very own choice to basically deny debt and for instance, say to fossil fuel firms that they're not inclined to refinance fossil fuel activities beyond a certain deadline, say 20, 30, 12 years from now on the IPCC report or the SDG deadline, or maybe even earlier or later, um, but they're only willing to refinance uh, energy firms if the purpose of proceeds actually is a green one. And so in that sense, we are very much aiming to inform society and we're aiming to end uh, certain intransparencies that were in the market, either inadvertently or maybe sometimes also for other reasons. And in that sense, the people that own the market are the people that are saving for the pensions. That's not yet our students, but it's our students soon. Um, then it's the young and the older and the older employees. And then, of course, it's the pensioners themselves as well. And so they have the ability to shape markets through their pension investments and also indirectly through the choice of insurance because effectively the insurance assets is also uh, societal assets in the end, at least indirectly. So, and that opportunity they can make hurt and then if society looks at, uh, for instance, corporate disclosure on greenhouse gas emissions, then we sadly have to say, as we can see from our project Climate Disclosure 100 on Info, um, that it's only really a handful of companies, maybe two dozen or so, that report 100% of the greenhouse gas emissions. The other ones are unfortunately not uh, living up to that standard of transparency. And so I very much encourage companies to take a scientific rather than a marketing-based approach to their corporate environmental responsibility. So really actually aim to have an impact on the planet rather than just impact your own reputation. Thanks so much, Andreas. So, as I understand, um, it seems debt instruments, uh, we should pay attention more to debt instruments and how um, we can impact green as well as defund um, fossil fuel intensive activities by refusing um, to refinance these. Right? If we look at the loans which are given to fossil fuel intensive companies, some of them are beyond 2000. 2030 to 2040, and so in that respect, uh, we should be thinking long term. Um, and as you said, companies should take a scientific 
uh, approach to to the climate challenge in terms of reporting, but also implementing some of these initiatives. Um, so that really leads me to the next question, which I'm going to turn to um, Martina. So Martina, what does it really mean to be a responsible corporation in the 21st century? Thanks a lot, Theo, and very interesting perspectives here. We're obviously looking at the wider investment value chain, corporate value chain picture. And it's, um, from my point of view, interesting to see that sustainable finance and social impact investing have certainly gained momentum, right, if we look at the recent years. And various initiatives have emerged both nationally and internationally in the private sector, on the regulatory level, as well as in academia, um, intended to create more sustainable financial markets. And uh, obviously the ambition is to withstand future challenges and to benefit from arising opportunities. But if we look at the picture overall, there are still, you know, some challenges ahead. We are aiming to achieve international sustainability targets, you know, so, you know, set by the Paris Agreement or the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs we're discussing here. But this requires a significant development of the sustainable finance market, you know, and that's actually across the stakeholder value chain as well as sustainable investments. And uh, it's interesting, corporations have a leading role to play here. You know, business scandals and governance controversies have actually shaken public confidence in global corporations over many years now. Um, so hence, corporate social responsibility is no longer just a means to an end. Um, we see that as the contrary. You know, doing well by doing good has become actually a positive performance management topic and question at a stock slash corporate as well as at a portfolio level. So hence, you know, it's a debate for the entire investment value chain. And investors and companies both understand now that there is an important role for ESNG, environmental, social and governance topics, and CSP, that's corporate social performance, when it comes to reputational, operational and business risk management. And I think it's no surprise that the upcoming UNEP FI responsible banking principles specifically aim and target these three levels. Um, and, and it's interesting, if, if we look at the wider picture, you know, companies are now defining um, a new sustainability and governance agenda, and they're covering broader issues, you know, looking at diversity, climate change, and disruptive technologies. So it's not just an, uh, sort of a, a, a specific micro level here that I'm highlighting, but the bigger macro context and uh, picture that companies are fully aware of um, and that are trying to, to integrate into their business decision making. And what you can see here on the slide is what I'm highlighting is the state of sustainable business in, in 2018 now into 19, um, where ultimately uh, companies are defining this new agenda. They are looking at the sustainable development goals as potential business strategy drivers and means to measure and benchmark sustainability issues. But there's also, and we've highlighted this, and I think Andreas just touched on it, there is actually an ongoing challenge. You know, there is ultimately still um, a need for enhanced cross-border collaboration and communication. Even communicating the message across the organization remains a challenge. And, you know, many key issues are still looked, looked at by businesses from a pure risk management, compliance, or control management perspective, rather from a value creation, growth, and opportunities management perspective. And this is, again, why it's important. We're discussing the role of also regulatory drivers as well as investor drivers here, because very often the whole context has been perceived by companies as a pure risk management and very often a pure reputational risk management perspective, as Andreas has highlighted. And this is by no means the case. You know, on the contrary, you can see here as well on the, on the right-hand side some of the key macro issues and trends, again, that I've highlighted when it comes to, you know, um, for instance, climate change, when it comes to demographic changes, when it comes to rising inequalities and others. There are, of course, key indicators, or these are key indicators of risk, but at the same time, you know, the right um, understanding of these risks also means there's a role for opportunity management here. And hence, leading businesses understand that they have a key part to play in, in order to uh, analyze, identify, and ultimately integrate these key mega and micro trends into their business strategy, into R&D, so research and development and innovation that can actually lead to job creation and growth. And that's what we have seen over the last decade or so in, in particular. And that's an ongoing and a, and a rising trend. Thank you so much, Martina. So then 
actually addressing the sustainable development goal. It's not about corporate social responsibility, but actually a strategic management issue, as you said, um, which require perhaps companies thinking differently about how they innovate, how they collaborate. Um, and as Andreas mentioned, in a, doing so in a scientific matter, manner. Um, well, that brings me really to Natasha, whose experience in uh, innovation working with companies within SAP and, and with uh, SAP's partners. Um, and Natasha, I would love for you to perhaps try to answer the same question. What, what does it mean to be a responsible corporation to you? And so what also what are some of the initiatives that um, you think are really making a difference with respect to the climate or environmental responsibility that companies are driving? So when we think about what it takes to be a responsible corporation in the 21st century, um, really look at the CEO, former CEO of Unilever, Paul Polman, who is really known as a standout CEO of the past decade when it comes to looking at purpose and profit and balancing those at the helm of a huge corporation where approximately 2.5 billion people use Unilever products every day. So this is a company that has to make some big numbers, but it's also got a huge environmental footprint with the products that it makes. So if we look at the behaviours that I think he role models in answer to this question, he's really emphasised the focus on long-term payback for investors and push this agenda with shareholders even when they've kind of given feedback to the country. He's made sure that sustainability has been at the forefront of his business strategy. It's not kind of CSR hasn't been a topic that's been pushed to the side. He's set stringent goals, so they want to reduce the environmental impact of its products by 2030. And kind of there is recognition that some of these goals have slipped, but the fact he's set them in the from the outset and they're kind of visible all over their website and all of the brand strategies that their marketers put together. You know, he's clearly set he's clearly set a corporate agenda for everybody that works there, and what they do as well is is aligned to external environmental goals and and packs. So it's really driven at the top by the CEO and the mantle has been picked up by the new CEO, Alan Jope. So purpose over profit is really their new mantra and they're looking to activate it. In terms of some examples of initiatives that I think make a difference or can make a difference with respect to climate and environmental challenges, you know, just recognising that climate challenge is a global problem, it's a man-made problem, we have to look at the bigger picture because these types of challenges require global solutions. So good initiatives are always one where there is collaboration with stakeholders that don't ordinarily speak to each other across the supply chain and also um, being open to, you know, innovate and test ideas and come up with new solutions. Um, so some of the innovation that we've worked on with um, customers, with our partners, with um, industry leaders, with governments, etc., have been looking at, you know, with new legislation that comes into place and new things like plastic tax in the back, in the back office, so e.g. all the finance, the procurement um, systems, the databases that hold information on the products that you see on the shop shelves, um, how do companies measure and track progress? Um, how can they deal with the new taxes? How do they deal with new compliance reporting that they need to do? How do they collect that data? How do they connect it? How, how is that then made available across the industry so that, you know, waste managers, for example, can consider what is, what's the infrastructure we need to make sure that, you know, plastic milk bottles are being created with the right technology, with the right materials so that further down the supply chain, we can actually recycle that. And also um, there's innovation with new marketplaces as well. So as we've moved from petrol and diesel cars to electric cars, um, technology has created new opportunities and really we've seen businesses businesses will need to fundamentally change how they operate. So even last week, you will have heard in the news that Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England, is already advising banks that they urgently need to reform. So no organisation or industry is immune from this problem. And in terms of technology and how that can help um, in this space as well, so, you know, to give two examples with blockchain, um, you know, SAP has worked with a, a number of organisations to ensure and enable traceability of, say, tuna stocks from ocean to table. And then with cloud computing in Brazil, um, we're helping to bring together lots of real-time data on farming, farming and harvest to improve production. 
So that's just a couple of um, initiatives where, you know, innovation and technology can really be used to look at things like, you know, how do we reduce um, plastic waste and also bigger climate change concerns as well. All right. Um, thank you, Natasha. So you highlighted that companies now who, who are really thinking about the future actually have a, a dual goal, right? Profit and purpose, which can also create opportunities for meaningful work, as we will uh, further explore. And of course, um, through your role, you've seen that technology actually um, can help a lot in the measurement and tracking the scientific, really scientific progress towards the sustainable development goals. Um, and, and so having said that, I, I really um, have to turn to the question of how can we actually avoid greenwashing? Because we've no, we know that last year we've had a new global peak in uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, in spite of the Paris Agreement and in spite of a lot of initiatives, right, to, to address climate change at the government and corporate level. So I'm turning to Andreas and then with, uh, to Sean on their perspective. So let's start with you, Andreas. How can companies avoid greenwashing? I think that the first instance is to look really for transparency because in many ways, conceptually, Greenwashing is the opposite of having an actual impact. So impact investing, if you have a real impact, is trying to make an impact, maybe not that much considering a commercial aspect, could maybe consider it more. On the other hand, greenwashing is trying to pretend one is good without actually making an impact or a significant change to one's own operations. So there is a degree of deception or a degree of least deflection in it. And so in that sense, it is very important, I think, to see it as a technical, as an engineering challenge of being fully transparent, also on those things where it's maybe a bit painful to be transparent. We as society then need to provide incentives for companies to do that. So someone who reports greenhouse gas emissions, even if they are high, if reported accurately, needs to be seen as better than someone who does not report any greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to provide the right incentives and recognize that for instance, U.S. oil companies are not particularly good. They don't report very well. The numbers will be very high. At the same time, some of the Russian and Chinese oil companies would be an even bigger issue. So in that sense, we need to create the incentives for companies to uh, be brave and be transparent, and be transparent not only on the things that are easy, but also on the things that are um, a bit painful because you don't actually are likely to change what you don't measure and what you don't engage with uh, at least to a degree publicly. And so it's an attitude part on the, partially on behalf of the company and partially on uh, part of society. We need to really look for actual impact engineering based solutions and not just flashy headlines and a couple of quick tweets. Thank you for that. So we have then to create the incentives, you said, for companies to be brave and transparent. So, so there are clearly some incentives now that um, or conflicts of interest, misalignments of interest that actually prevent companies to do so, right? So it may be that you want to do the right thing, but because the market doesn't reward it or some other company who's your competitor um, doesn't choose to, to be as transparent uh, as you are, that you may actually be penalized for that. So um, many companies uh, and, and even governments have, have issued green bonds. Um, and so I would love to turn to Sean and see and ask you, Sean, how how do we interpret the fact that a company issues a green bond? Is that a statement of you know the state of the art of where you are in your sustainability journey, or is that just the beginning? Um, how how should we look at at the transition through the eyes of green bonds and through the sustainability journey of of companies? Look, what we're trying to do is to make clear what are the kinds of investments needed for the future and to help people disclose when they have investments that are material to that future we're trying to create. Now, any organization or any company can do this. So it's not a judgment on whether the company as a human being equivalent is good or bad. It's a judgment on their specific activities. It's a bit like we're saying that your activities in the morning 
going for a walk instead of driving are good, whereas when you get in a petrol fuel car, that's bad. And th that's what the taxonomy tries to do. Now, you disclose that, you can invest in new activities, and you can do this whether you're a building property company that has some green buildings or whether you're a wind energy company that is, let's say, otherwise seen as 100% pure. That's what you're trying to do. We haven't had a lot of greenwashing in the market so far. What we have had is a lot of misunderstanding. So people often talk about greenwashing. The comment you made earlier about greenhouse gases going up, that's because we haven't done enough action to ensure that the right incentives are in place, the right enabling infrastructure, but simply the right regulations. You know, We should not be allowing people to buy and sell houses now that don't get an energy performance certificate of a minimum level. Well, in some countries, that's exactly what's happening, but not many. That's a simple example. We should not be building cities anywhere in the world now that don't have a strong basis of mass transit and bicycling and pedestrian walkways as part of them, as distinct from cities that we're building, which are built around the, the old-fashioned uh, car. These are things that we've got to identify clearly as the right activities for the future, and that's what a taxonomy does, and separate them out. You know, in the last few years, one of the reasons emissions have gone up rather than gone down is that we've put in more air conditioning in buildings in hot countries than new renewable energy capacity globally. So, naturally, our electricity emissions from gas and coal keep going up because the renewable energy capacity can't even keep up with the massive amount of air conditioning put in. So we need to know what kind of cooling systems are right for the future. And they have to be low energy. We have to have building design that is consistent with properly managing energy use in a hot climate, for example. These are the sort of things that taxonomies flesh out. And these are the sort of things that will make it easier for companies and for individuals and investors to know what is right and wrong? It's complicated. If you read the IPCC report, the International Panel of Climate Change, it is really complicated. None of us can hope to get on top of all the issues. But if we can get help, if we can get a science-based approach, which is what we're doing in the technical expert group, we have 100 people from the technical expert group and uh, commission staff and another 150 technical experts from around Europe contributing to this process plus all the people that have put in submissions from our consultations, we think we can get to a reasonable level of confidence around what the right investments are for the future. And that's the main antidote to the concerns around greenwashing, which are mainly about people not being sure, is this in or not? I mean, a gas plant, that's a lot better than coal, isn't it? But should it be called green? What about my car that is a hybrid Lexus? Or will that count? Well, no, I can give you the answers to those, but watch for the, the taxonomy when it comes out. And that'll be the key antidote we have. Of course, there are other things as well. There is the Green Bond Standard that the Commission will be enacting later this year, which might, provides very clear guidelines on the reporting and, as Andrea says, the transparency issues. We all need to be able to look at these things and understand it. And we need to be able to relate it to our own lives. So I want to know, for example, whether the building I'm in is green or not? What's the labelling system? How do I make sure it gets labelled? You know, everything should be labelled around us. So they, are the transport system we're using the right kind of transport system? When I get on a diesel passenger train or, or so on, is that in or is that out? Steel, aluminium, the products we use, the cement we use. Well, actually, I can tell you that the cement we're using is the wrong cement. Cement is, contributes 7% of global emissions. We have some options on the table now that would reduce that emissions footprint by 70 or 80 percent. We're simply not rolling them out. We need to mandate those solutions to make sure industry works on them. And that's the sort of stuff that if you don't go through the process, you don't necessarily understand. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do in all of this. Now, out of this, we expect to see a rapid, large growth of green finance to meet our goals. We have investors saying, tell us what to invest in, show us the opportunities. But I just want to stress, this isn't taking away the job that government has to do. Because what government and public sector institutions like development banks have to do is they also ensure that dirty brown investments that contribute to our high carbon stocks are phased out or frankly outlawed. 
that's got to be a public sector, a community acting together as government role. And also that we bias the cost of capital towards green. That's what development banks can do by ensuring that the lower cost capital for a railway over a freeway. There's still a big agenda beyond what we're doing at the moment with the technical expert group. Mm -hmm. So it seems that we have a lot of misunderstanding and not necessarily always greenwashing. Um, and really, it seems that the opinion, or at least on the technical expert group and what I'm hearing, is that we need an engineering challenge. We need This is a technical challenge, and, and we should go away um, and away from making it a political or a marketing challenge on, on you know, who claims the best credentials. Um, and so this is, this is really exciting uh, for me. But what I would love to do now, uh, also in the interest of time, is try to translate everything that you've said to the individual level. In a low-carbon world, how are we really impacted how can we make decisions as in individuals about our livelihoods and our careers mainly? So I, I would love to turn to Martina and say, um, should students strike or study, um, Martina? And, and do you think really um, sustainability already offers a competitive advantage for companies uh, in terms of recruiting the best and the brightest? A very interesting question, actually, and uh, I would like to add what we've just heard. It's obviously a question of misunderstanding when it comes to green washing, but it's also a question of misalignment and disalignment, you know, of, of different perspectives across the value chain, and that includes actually consumers and that includes the beneficiaries and plan members that Andreas highlighted, you know, the pension plan members. So the youngsters, the, the likes of ourselves, I would call us all still to that generation. Um, and it is literally our responsibility to get engaged and to have a fine balance and the right approach, I would call it a healthy balance, between research, so study, and actions. You know, what we have seen over the years that advocacy ultimately has led to engagement actions and engagement with investors and peers from a company perspective has led to the development and ongoing improvement of industry standards and, for instance, also disclosure of some of the key issues. We highlighted climate change in this debate, you know, and the, the work of Climate Action 100 Plus and other former initiatives should not be forgotten and definitely be highlighted in this context in particular. But there's also now um, employee action when it comes to the next stage, you know, of, of engagement action. And um, so what I feel is that without the relevant and ever-evolving theory, which is obviously the research and the study element, practice is ultimately running at risk of running out of innovation and, and front-edge sort of leadership. So what is the role of, of the stakeholder and the millennials in this context? I think they have to engage more on behalf of their interests, engage with their plans, with hence their pension plans and investors, at large, there is obviously, and there are various initiatives and groups out here, such as Share Action, who are actually acting on behalf of us, the beneficiaries and society at large, but also ultimately directly with, with companies, because ultimately we should not forget all of us are in some way or shape or form beneficiaries, and we are also actors if it comes to, for instance, being an employee. And I think there's been too much time spent so far on focusing only on individual components and parts of the investment value chain. And we need to see, in order to align the efforts, we need to see how we can actually bring across our specific aims uh, across um, the spectrum when it comes to corporate strategy, operations, transactions, what I've mentioned, when it also comes to the wider value chain, that's consumers, that's suppliers, that's ultimately investors. And we need to understand that every little component in that chain has a role or every single individual in that chain has a role to play and we discussed that regulation should actually enhance the debate and is not necessarily limiting it so i hope you know with what we are we're discussing over here is obviously the alignment between the regulatory side and drivers as well as the investors and the corporate perspectives that we're seeing more alignment also you know, at a society level at large. And I truly hope, you know, that in the next decade or so, where we're seeing now the, the, the major part of the wealth transfer happening, that now with the millennials,
being investors as well as being employees at large, that they can actually drive that change and can ultimately align the current misperceptions that are still persistent in the industry. Thanks, Martina. So definitely, uh, I think the issue of engagement of the young generation, um, I think that is growing, right, as we see with the 1.6 million teenagers who are very much engaged. Um, and I wonder whether in 10 years' time they would actually want to work for any of the fossil fuel companies. I very much doubt that. Uh, but I would love to get the perspective of Natasha and Elena, um, who work in corporates, and I would like to know whether, for example, in, in your initiatives, uh, particularly related to the environment, um, do you think that having a specialized degree in the environment matters? Or can you actually make a difference? And of course, uh, and how, right, from uh, if you go towards, a, let's say, a traditional career path? Uh, I would love to hear your views on, on, on that. So shall we start with Natasha? Sure. So in terms of a traditional path, I think, you know, this is, um, you know, an urgent problem and it's one that's not going away. So we've been warned by, you know, the world's leading scientists that we have only 12 years to keep the temperature between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius to avoid complete environmental breakdown. So traditionally, um, you know, there were quite formal routes if you wanted to go into what was known as a, a green job. So, for example, you know, doing something like working for the UN or working in a sustainability part of a company. I think now the urgency is on all of us doing this. Um, so I don't think you necessarily need a degree uh, to contribute to the topic. My cousin is studying, you know, a geography degree, um, which is an example of, I think, millennials hugely motivated by this topic and actually are campaigning for change and, and wanting to do something about it. So, you know, my role is in innovation. I'm not formally part of my sustainable team, but increasingly I'm having to work with clients and looking at how do we use technology and design to innovate and help come up with solutions for the biggest environmental crisis that we have in our hands right now. So I would say that it's kind of up to individuals and um, you know, where possible, some of that is you have to go and research it yourself and use the wide um, array of TV and news and social media uh, sources, uh, use, use them as sources for information. And then also, you know, push your company and make sure that, you know, it's signed up to things like the SDG goals and you know, educating yourself on the topic and compelling others to do the same. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, Elena, do you agree with that? And from the perspective of the ESG business unit of Refinitiv, um, what kind of skills do you do you look for in your, you know, do you need to have an environmental degree to, to, to be an environmental finance analyst? Um, yes. I mean, the direction in which we're moving is, clear and unquestionable, and there is no turning back, there is no slowing down. Um, for corporations understanding and executing the necessary changes in business and client service models um, to accommodate that new sustainable finance agenda will be critical for any, any corporation as it seeks to respond to the changing customer demands and, and the new norm, um, as we described it. Specifically for the financial sector, in the years to come, um, investment professionals will need to exhibit a much higher degree of ESG knowledge and consciousness when making any investment decision, while continuing to deliver, of course, financially positive performance. Um, that's the only way to successfully gain, gain the trust and the business of this and the next generation of clients. Um, at Refinitiv, we have comprehensive ESG data on thousands of publicly listed companies and the good news is that there are many examples of, of corporate sustainable leadership and more actually is emerging across different sectors. These companies, of course, put a strong emphasis on recruiting the best and the brightest talent. And our research um, has shown and illustrates that such companies are delivering superior returns. Um, and I think it's important also to, to uh, reflect back on um, old generations um, because many of us spend more time thinking about uh, free trade coffee or free land eggs 
but not about the impact of our own savings and pensions. Um, it is time that we take control back of our own money and ask questions about the companies in which they're invested. Thank you so much, Elena. So, so, so it, it's hard to do justice to, to such a broad topic. And as we've heard, at the individual level, we, we shouldn't just think about our careers, um, but also how we can make an impact to our own investments, which is a bit different to being an everyday consumer, perhaps to going to the shop. This is about perhaps engaging with your own employer or your pension provider as a purchaser of financial services. Um, and so that is also one way to, to make a difference. Um, and uh, in the interest of time, um, I'm now going to refer to um, one of the questions that we've received, and I would encourage you to, to send more our way. Um, at the moment, we have two questions which, which broadly um, address the same issue. Um, and so uh, one person asks, um, I would like the panel to also address uh, the need for investment in adaptation as well as mitigation, and how this could be included in sustainable growth. Um, so I am maybe looking at uh, Sean, Elena, and Andreas in investment in adaptation. Uh, how does the EU Commission think about adaptation versus mitigation in its efforts? Uh, let, let me say very clearly, we have lost the fight for climate change the first fight. That's what we should have won over the last 30 years. As a result, we have consigned ourselves, and more importantly, the vulnerable of the planet, to a very difficult century of extreme weather incidences, especially heat strikes that will kill people, as have already been killing people in places like uh, India a couple of years ago, where many thousands of people died in consecutive weeks of 50 degrees Celsius heat, to storms, to epidemics that follow these disruptions. We have to now think about resilience and adaptation. Part of that is the simple infrastructure hardening thing. Mumbai is going to become a cyclone zone. It's going to be flooded regularly. It has to figure out now whether it can adapt to those changes or, frankly, whether it has to be evacuated. Many cities around the world will end up being evacuated, like Miami, there's no way to adapt. Miami will become Venice by 2050 or else it'll be empty, more likely empty. We also, though, need to be thinking about our social and economic and ecosystem resilience. We have a massive uh, extinction event going on now. The more we deplete our ecosystems, the more fragile they become in the face of severe weather disruption, which means they collapse as Puerto Rico's uh, environment collapsed during the cyclones in the last uh, couple of years. And that's going to become the norm around the world. We need healthy bio systems. And now that means we need to regrow old forests. We need to regrow our mangroves. We need to ensure that our fisheries are stocked. We need to turn 15% of the planet into marine reserves and land reserves as well. These are the sort of things. That, but we also need economic and social resilience. The Philippines, India, Tropical Africa are going to have a very difficult time. They need to be richer and more able to cope. We need to ensure the Gini coefficient is addressed. The more unequal a society is, the more fragile it is, the more likely it collapses in the context of a drought or a severe weather incident or famine. If it is, has a better Gini coefficient, it's more equal, it bounces back faster. This now has to become the stuff of economic planning for the planet. And someone asked, is there a moral duty of the rich? Well, of course there is. It's not just the developed world. You need to understand that since 1980, we have put more emissions into the atmosphere than the previous 150 years. China is now one of the culpable nations. And I say this coming from Shanghai, where I am now. So it's not just the US and England, etc. But of course, they should be doing something. Are we going to get them to fork over billions of dollars or hundreds of billions of dollars? No. But there is one thing we can get them to do, which is to ensure that we buy down the cost of capital for the mitigation and for the resilience and adaptation infrastructure needed in richer countries. That is an achievable objective in the context of what we're facing now. And that's what we're going to have to do. And if you're a young person, if I can just talk about careers, 
this is going to be the defining issue of our century. If we are able to address the mitigation challenge and the resilience challenge, we will see the biggest investment in how we run our societies that the world has ever seen. We will see the creation of jobs, we will cre creation of whole new industries to deal with these challenges. We also need to do it because if we don't, there is frankly no future for us as a species going forward. We are facing species extinction in the next couple of hundred years on the current trajectory. When you're thinking about your future, think about this. There will be opportunities. There will be enormous opportunities, but think big now. What the world is going to need is people who are anticipating the problems, coming up with solutions for the problems going forward. These people are gold dust for our future. That should be the future generations. That should be people at university now. And that's not just in physics or engineering. It's in social sciences. How do we make uh, uh, resilient eco environmental, social and ecosystems? It's about urban planners. The nature of urban development has got to be entirely different. But it's also about historians. We need to learn about how we failed in the last 150 years so economies that are growing can leapfrog past those failures into a green future. Everyone, everyone has an opportunity to work to create the kind of future we need. What a uplifting way to, to, to bring this to a close. Uh, before we do that, uh, I'm delighted to say that uh, also here in Dublin, we're uh, throughout the MSE in Renewable Energy and Environmental Finance, we are trying, and well, with Andres' leadership, I'm sure we're succeeding in instilling the, um, in our students the fact that this is a scientific issue and that it's very important for uh, ultimately um, the future of society. So, so we're hoping that um, whoever tries to pursue a career in environmental management, environmental finance, or even within their current workplaces trying to make a difference towards the environment for societal uh, well-being, uh, we are very glad to support that from, from an educational standpoint. And as I see all of you uh, from your current positions in policy and, uh, um, and corporate. So with that, I would like to thank you so much for um, to, to the speakers, to Sean, to Andrea, Selena, Martina, and Natasha. Um, it was hard to do justice to such a broad topic, that, but I think we've, we've done a great job. It was really fun for me to, to moderate this. And for all of you who may have further questions, please feel free to engage with me or Andreas on LinkedIn, and uh, we can get back to you. So uh, thank you so much again, all. And thank you so much for, uh, to Bright Talk for hosting us. Uh, also, yes, please do keep in... Uh, uh, just keep an eye out for further uh, webinars which Martina and Ryan are preparing for you. So thank you again all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.